Hey, it's Jim, and this is FRM Part 1, the topic on financial markets and products, and the chapter on banks. Welcome to this first chapter on banks inside of this topic. Note that there are 20 chapters here in Part 1 under financial markets and products, and what you'll see as we go through these learning objectives is a lot of action words that sound like describe and explain and distinguish and identify. And what I want you to think about, not just this particular chapter, but the next 20 chapters, is that GARP is laying the foundation here in part one. Most of the material is going to be definitional and a little bit of application. We'll use our financial calculator a little bit, but not, not a lot. This lays the foundation for other topics inside of part one, like uh, you know foundations in risk management, which of course then lays the foundation for the topics in part two. So I want you to focus today and through these next 20 chapters on things like definitions and how to make decisions based on those definitions and what that leads to down the line. All right, so what are some important kinds of definitions and topics here? So major risks, that's a super easy one. So we'll talk about the difference between economic and regulatory capital. By the way, that's one of the questions at the end of the chapter, that second learning objective. So make sure you uh, pay attention there. We'll talk about governing bodies uh, you know, throughout the entire part one and part two. We'll talk about moral hazard. That's probably super important. Financing arrangements, conflicts of interest, uh, Another question that shows up at the end of the chapter is uh, the banking book and the trading book. And then we'll spend a handful of slides on this originate to distribute banking model benefits and drawbacks. When I make up questions for my students, I always like to embed. You guys remember this when you were undergraduates? I imagine your professors gave you a SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And I think that's a great way to approach not just these series of 20 chapters, but everything that you get in part one and part two. If you can do a SWOT analysis, and that's pretty much what that last learning objective asks us to do, uh, but it just couches them in the terms of benefits and drawbacks. All right, so let's get started with the type of banks, and so that we can uh, so that we can then identify those major risks. Uh, I'm guessing that most of you work either in the commercial banking industry or the investment banking industry, so you know exactly the difference between these two types of financial institutions. But you need to get probably some historical perspective to, to illustrate the difference because, you know, the wall that separates commercial and investment banking, you know, has been crumbling and crumbling, and I'm not even sure that it exists anymore, um, with the exception of... Uh, professional organizations like GARP who say, you know what, even if the government allows commercial banking and investment banking to, to, to mash and merge, that there are some ethical issues and professional standards uh, under which that we should all as good financial risk managers abide. All right, how about some of these risks, major risks? Here, watch this. So I'm gonna skip ahead here for just a second. So there are market risks. We'll summarize that in that table. There are credit risks and then there are operational risks. So let's think about uh, each of those individually. You know, when I, whenever I think about market risks and I think about uh, the way to present this to students, I always say something like, you know, market risks are any kind of a risk that generally have to do with pricing. And when I say pricing, of course, I mean like, you know, the price of a bond or the price of a credit default swap. But then the other side, that also includes interest rates. So you got to worry about the yield curve. You have to worry about the twisting and shaping of the yield curve. So notice, the GARP's definition there, bank's exposure to fluctuations in market variables, exchange rates, interest rates, equity prices, fixed income prices, commodity prices, uh, even extend that into the prices of alternative investment universe. So, you know, the interesting thing is that, all right, we can come up with a model to price a financial security, but is that model worth it? You know, we can get out our financial calculator and compute the price of a bond with those super five easy time value of money buttons, but is that worth it? And I always tell my students, yes, but I also call that model, I call it the kindergarten model because 
uh, anybody can understand the price of a bond is the present value of its uh, promised cash flows. But then, then if that model works, then we need to figure out how and what input variables are going to determine changes in the price of that bond and any other financial security. So that first diamond point there, I, I, I can't imagine that's not a, a really good question on, on the exam. Uh, and there's some examples there that you can read through. Um, look down at that bottom diamond point. Banks, exposure to market variable movements. All right, so what does that mean? Market variable movements, those are listed up at the top. What that means then is that a good financial institution is probably exposed to each of those types of risks inside of market risk, which means that we need to be aware of these. We need to identify them, right? Then we need to quantify them and then we need to manage them. We'll talk about that throughout uh, part one and part two, but those exposures probably come from the trading operations. Of course, what do we do as a good financial institution? You know, we help our clients, we help them buy and sell securities. Sometimes we own them. Sometimes we help companies and governments issue them. And so, you know, on any given day, we can look in our inventory and say, oh my gosh, we've got, uh, you know, we've got 14 million uh, treasury securities that mature next Tuesday. How are we going to manage that over the next uh, five or seven days? Here's a good box. Uh, I say this pretty regularly. Uh, you might want to get out your phone and uh, take a picture of this box here. This will give you uh, just a summation and and you'll have it on your phone. And, you know, by the time we're done all these uh, recordings, you'll have a good file on your phone and you'll be able to scroll through them when you're riding on the train or the bus or the airplane or just sitting in your library at home. All right, so we have interest rate risk. So this has everything to do with the simple fact that interest rates, all right, so what do we mean by interest rates? Some kind of a yield curve. You know, when you talk about yield curves, you start with the yield curve for U.S. Treasury securities, and then you work your way upwards all the way to super risky. You know, I think we call those uh, speculative bonds or maybe high yield bonds. And so the, the, the simple definition of interest rate risks means that when interest rates change, when that yield curve either moves upward or downward or twists, that's, got, that's going to have an impact not only, not only on fixed income securities, but it's also going to have an impact on equity securities and alternative investments and currency returns uh, and commodity prices. So that's a big one there over on the top left. But then what we can do is identify foreign exchange risk for banks who have deposits over there somewhere, right? Uh, equity price risk, we're investing in equity securities as financial institutions. I mean, we have all sorts of different types of investments. Uh, liquidity risk. I mean, this is huge for financial institutions. I imagine that uh, SV Bank is popping into your head about all of these kinds of risks, interest rate risk, of course, and liquidity risk. This is how I tell my students. I say, you know, when you go to the floor of the New York Stock Exchange and you want to buy shares of a company like Johnson & Johnson or Procter & Gamble, you know, when you go down and, and you find the you know, the specialist or the market maker or whatever they're calling it these days on the New York Stock Exchange, you're never going to say, I want to buy, you know, 100 shares of Procter & Gamble. And that individual is never going to say, I'm sorry, I don't have any of those. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I might eat my words during some kind of tremendous market crash, but, you know, outside of just a very short window, there's Really, really little problems of liquidity on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Although, of course, there have been moments of lapses in liquidity, but those are those are short term. But if you go to the bond exchange, you may find a bond trader who says, oh, I wish I had some of those bonds, but I can get them for you. But you're going to have to pay. You know, so liquidity risk is a huge thing, especially with fixed income securities. And then commodity price risk, of course, commodities can mean, you know, almost anything uh, uh, that we eat or consume, you know, uh, orange juice or gold. And then look at that top right one there. I, I mean, I love this correlation risk. What do we know? We know that investors love diversification because correlations between and among different types of equities, different types of fixed income, different types of alternative investments, these things tend to have low correlations. However, we know that during a market crash that those correlations, they all move together and they all move close to one. So what good is diversification if when we have a crash that 
it occurs in the stock market that that overflows into the fixed income market and it overflows into the alternative markets. And then all of a sudden we thought we had good diversification because low correlations. And then all of a sudden they, uh, uh, they, they move towards one. That's why we're going to spend lots and lots of super fun time talking about uh, copulas and how they kind of, kind of resolve some of the problems in measuring correlation. All right, how about moving on to credit risks? You know, in general, credit risk is, you know, the kind of this umbrella of risk that simply can be summarized by saying, you know, whenever there's a loan, it's a legal and binding contract. What are the inputs that are going to get in the way of the borrower repaying to, uh, to the lender? So notice we have in bold up there, failure to repay their debts. And this can be something just super simple like a car loan for a financial institution. However, you know, how much does a financial institution lend to an automobile owner? 20,000, 30,000, 50,000. You know, if you add those, uh, you know, who knows what you get? I mean, you could get a couple million or you could get a hundred million for a particular financial institution. But when it lends money to corporations, it's not going to be 40,000 or 50,000. It's going to be a hundred million or 50 million or whatever that number is. So how do we manage this credit risk as a good financial institution? Well, of course, we charge an interest rate uh, on, on that loan. So the source of funds, you know, maybe is a deposit over here. Maybe we're paying 2% on the deposit, but over here we're lending them out at 3% or 5% or 10%, whatever that is. And so this part of the chapter focuses on what's this net interest margin. So look at the red there. So cost of funds. So that cost of fund cost of funds, 2% in this example, this reflects essentially the credit risk of the borrower. Now, of course, that credit risk of the borrower is going to depend on the ability of that borrower to repay. So in this example, it's 2%, but it could be 1% or it could be 5% or it could be 10%. And then what happens then, we need to add a premium to that interest rate to cover lots of other stuff. What the chapter emphasizes here are the administrative costs and then some kind of a built in, you know, required return on investment. Uh, the chapter calls this pro uh, profit. So notice at the end, our cost of funds are 2%, but we're generating three and a half percent. So that's the net interest margin. I think if you just remember this, uh, this illustration, you'll be able to answer those questions there. All right, how about some uh, continuing discussion here on credit risk? So loan losses uh, depend entirely on economic conditions ma at the macro level and then uh, on the individual borrower's conditions uh, at the micro level. And so what a good financial institution should do, and I say this regularly to my students, a good financial institution should do this, comma, even in the absence of government uh, influence with laws and regulations, right? A good financial institution acting as good stewards of the capital should maintain enough capital to cover, you know, the expected losses and the unexpected losses. And we'll talk about that throughout uh, part one and part two. But what the chapter emphasizes here is to cover rare and extreme losses. And so just, just think of this enough capital is, is a buffer. Uh, whatever that buffer means and whatever that buffer does. And of course, it's up to the chief risk officer and the board of directors to determine what that buffer is. Now, of course, again, there are government bodies and regulatory bodies who will come in and say, you know, we don't trust you to do this on your own. So you have to have a minimum level of capital. But the minimum level of capital is probably not something that uh, shareholders, comma, if they were aware of all of these risks, comma, would, uh, would be happy about. Uh, derivatives, which of course is one of my favorite topics because derivative securities, what they do is they allow us to increase our spanning. This is the term that my professors in graduate school used. You know, think about it. You have, you have fixed income securities and equity securities. Just think of those two. And then what goes in between? Well, there's lots of stuff that could go in between, but derivatives, what they do is they expand the investment opportunity uh, set. Uh, my professors called that spanning. What 
derivative securities then this is interesting and this is probably a really good exam question so when you when you trade derivatives you have to worry about market risk but you also have to worry about credit risk because in the derivatives market what two people are doing or two organizations are doing or two entities are doing is agreeing today signing a legal and binding contract right derivative their contracts forward contract futures contract option contract swap contract they're all legal and binding contracts so these two parties are agreeing to do something in the future which means that by the time that something in the future occurs, there could be market risk changes and there could be credit risk changes. So make sure that you know derivatives have all different sorts of risks. Now, speaking of governing bodies, uh, the International Financial Reporting Standards Board, they require banks to show these outstanding principles uh, based on estimated expected losses over some time period. And I think that rule nine tells us that we need to go, uh, we need to go 12 months. But you guys know this as good uh, risk managers. We ought to not just say we don't care what happens in 367 days from today because it's not in that 12 month window. We need to worry about not just 367, but 1,367 and 10,367. Boy, how many, how many years is 10,367? I'm going to get my calculator out and I'm going to do that here. Um, what did I say? Uh, 10,367 divided by 365. That's 28 years, so maybe that's a little bit long, but uh, either way. All right, how about operational risks? We're going we're gonna to look at this definition probably 100 times in part one and part two. And so sooner or later, you're going to have this memorized for the exam. Uh, risk of loss, inadequate or failed internal processes. So, I mean, think about what that means inside of a financial institution. Just the process, the simple process of, and you know, we have to go back to the old days to do this. Having a client walk in and walk up to the teller and says, I would like to apply for a car loan. And then the teller says, okay, go somewhere over there and meet that person over there and then that person. So that could be a simple internal process. You know, forget about all the computer technology and algorithms that go into all of the other internal processes. All right, so that's the first part of operational risk. Then people and systems, whatever those people and systems are. Think of the rogue traders that have uh, hit the Wall Street Journal highlights over the years. And then external events. I mean, of course, what's on everyone's mind these days, uh, external events are things like COVID, right? And going back to 2008 financial crisis, going back to 1929 and the stock market crash and subsequent depression, et cetera, et cetera. So how about categories of operational risk? These are really, really good questions here, but I'm guessing, <clears throat> I'm guessing that this is common sense for most of you. Internal and external fraud practices, safety, clients, products, and business practices. Notice there's uh, some money laundering, and we'll, we'll talk about money laundering in, in a chapter sometime uh, in the future. Uh, damage to physical assets, so this could be the result of terrorism, but also earthquakes and, uh, and hurricanes, business disruptions, execution, delivery, and process management. So it, here's the thing, I'm guessing that GARP on an exam question would give you an example that specifically I would enable you to identify one of these categories. But remember, the correlation coefficient between and among these categories is not zero. So there has to be some kind of a relationship in there. Here's another good time for you to get out your phone and, uh, and take a picture. This addresses the learning objective about the difference between economic and regulatory capital. Uh, what did I say just a few moments ago? Think about this, uh, this capital as the buffer. You know, how much do we need to set aside so that we can handle any kind of loss that comes our way? You know, my father, when he was alive, he always had a big bucket in, uh, in, his, in his kitchen where he, had, he would put all his change and he would put all his dollar bills and $10 bills and he would never touch it because he would say, you know what? When my grandchildren need some money, I'm going to reach into my bucket and I'm going to be able to, I'm going to, be able to help them out. So, you know, my dad's uh, little bucket is like, is like this capital. Now you have to distinguish between what the regulators tell us, all right, so required by regulators to ensure solvency. Boy, that's just gonna blow out my brain from my ears. Uh, 
you know, to ensure solvency, what that means is that you should have as much cash on the left-hand side of your balance sheet as you have loans and other stuff on the right-hand side of the balance sheet. But of course, if you do that as a financial institution, you make something like a, a minus uh, profitability ratio. So we know that that's not, uh, that's not theoretically possible. But the regulators, I mean, these, these men and women, these, they work really, really hard to come up with ideas about, all right, what is this required regulatory capital that will that will boy ensure guarantee those, those are tough words but will they pr promote solvency ha ah, that sounds uh, that sounds a little bit better right it targets expected losses and so just think about this way that uh, if I come in to your financial institution and I say hey I want to borrow fifty thousand dollars to buy a car and you look at me and you say you know what Jim you're 61 years old you've been a college professor for a hundred years you own your home you got a good retirement you know you probably have uh, you probably have z almost a zero percent chance of failing to repay so my expected loss right on that on that, what I say, fifty thousand dollar car loan. I, you know, if you if you did a thousand of me, you know, maybe it's a thousand dollars or or five thousand. I don't know what it is. So that's pretty low. But if you lump one of my sons in there, you know, my son recently graduated from college. He has a good job, but he has no track record of any kind of responsibility. So you know, his his expected loss is going to be higher than my expected loss standardized rules and calculations and this is a desire not only not only <clears throat> to try to smooth out the volatility inside of a, and outside of a financial institution but to protect depositors for specific financial institutions and then pr protect depositors in general uh, economic capital on the other hand is an internal measure and this is like my dad this is my dad covering all that stuff that he needs he needs a big bucket of cash so that he can uh, help out his grandchildren whenever they're in need you know he decided on how much money and he always said i'm not going in there and he used to tell my mother when she was alive he would say look that's my money for my grandchildren i don't want you going in there of course my mother would dip in there so she could go buy a case of natural light oh my gosh i miss those days when my parents were around but here's the other cool thing, and I think this is the more important question on the exam, economic capital. This targets unexpected losses. So you got to think to yourself right now, at least initially here in part one, well, how do we measure an unexpected loss? Well, we're going to spend lots and lots of time on this. But what we're trying to do is we're going to try to capture, you know, uh, the tail of a distribution, you know, probably the left hand tail where we're saying, you know, what? what's the absolute worst thing that can happen? We don't expect it to happen. But what happens if we have another COVID? What happens if we have an earthquake? What happens if we have another September 11th? What happens if we have another depression like we had in the 1930s? You know, these are unexpected losses. We need to manage those. Now, of course, the chief risk officer and the board of directors is going to identify a confidence level. Do we want to be confident at 90%? Do we want to be confident at 99.9%? This is where we'll actually get out our financial calculators later on in, in part one and, of course, in part two to try to figure out what that means. And these are based on bank-specific models. And I'm guessing there's uh, at least a handful of you guys out there, maybe lots of you who are quite familiar with these bank-specific models. I mean, of course, course, if you're a giant bank, you have one model. But if you're, you know, kind of a regional mid-sized bank like like SV Bank, you, you have probably a different model. Now, these models are all related. So I like the goal down here at the bottom right. Optimize capital allocation. I'm a big I'm a big asset allocator, not only as a professor, but also as a uh, as a, a parent and a husband uh, to optimize something. So capital allocation, what are we trying to do? We're trying to allocate our capital to the, its most efficient use, which then is gonna generate those returns that our bondholders and our shareholders are going to demand. All right, so here's a good illustration here. There's regulatory capital. Uh, and there's economic capital. So there's the expected loss and there's the unexpected loss. Notice that the little uh, uh, a vertical dot there determined by the confidence level associated with this targeted, targeted rating. So that comes to the leadership of the executive. Notice out to the right of that loss is so remote that capital is not provided to cover for them. So what is the absolute worst case scenario? 
I don't really have a good example here, but uh, you know, I'm going to go back to that great movie from the 1980s. You ever watch War Games with the dude from uh, Ferris Bueller? Uh, you know, there's a, a computer that takes over the U.S. defense system and tries to launch uh, a thermonuclear war. So, nuclear war. So what happens then is that, boy, are we really going to worry about uh, our bond portfolio if nuclear warheads are raining down upon us? So that's pretty much what uh, what I come up with. But everything else and everything else can be identified inside of that uh, unexpected loss category. And we'll go ahead and uh, we'll go ahead and talk about that at length. Uh, throughout parts one and parts two. Let me go ahead and call your attention to the diamond point down there at the bottom. Loss expected to be exceeded only once every 1,000 years. I don't really know what that means. I will share something and I'll give you advice as parents or grandparents. Uh, when my daughter was born, my mother gave her a card that says, you know, what? what I don't know what I'm going to be doing in a thousand years, but I know that I will love you. So think about once every thousand years. Who has any idea what the heck is going on in a thousand years, right? All right, so we have these uh, regulatory organizations like the Basel Committee. So this Committee on Bank Supervision, this was created a long, long time ago. I was uh, 13 years old. And essentially what happened was that, you know, you think about what was going on. You know, we had World War II. And then we had the 1960s, you know, whatever was going on there. And then, I mean, so much happened in the early 1970s. You know, we had uh, whole uh, massive events in the energy market. Uh, we had Watergate and the resignation of a president inside of the United States. So we had unstable capital markets. We also went away from the old gold standard in uh, foreign exchange. So all this increased volatility, essentially, so uh, the countries got together and said, you know what, we need to have somebody oversight this. And that's what uh, the BCBS was formed back in 1974. But back then it was focused on credit risk only. But then, of course, uh, it has evolved to include market risk and operational risk. Uh, you know, you think about the events, you know, we had the 80s, which was, you know, pretty much an expanding economy time period. But then we had recessions, you know, early 1990s. And we had another expansion and then we had uh, September 11th. And, you know, so the committee then got together and they added market risk and operational risk. Um, but I think one of the really good exam questions, and this shows up at the end of the chapter, identify and explain the two liquidity ratio requirements that came out of the 2008 financial crisis, liquidity coverage ratio. So an, enough funding. Uh, for 30 days. So think about this is a, uh, is a it's a short term measure, a short term ratio to see how are we going to move forward in 30 days. Now, of course, I'm going to piggyback on what I said earlier. You know, we, we need to have a liquidity coverage ratio for 60 days and 90 days. We need to do all that. But what came out of this uh, Basel committee was this uh, 30 day liquid coverage ratio. And then, as you guys who know uh, SV Bank uh, secured a mismatch between a bank's assets and its liabilities, and of course, SV Bank was not the first bank that was exposed to this. This goes all the way to the first bank. Uh, you know, the first bank was probably created by the Phoenicians whenever they were alive. Uh, the net stable funding ratio, what this tells us is it looks at the assets and liabilities and says something like, oh, you know what? Our assets are sufficient to cover to cover those liabilities or, or they are not. All right, here's some motivations here. These are good questions. So financial stability, that makes sense. Risk management. Now, remember that, you know, going back to 1974, no corporations, no financial institutions had formally a chief risk officer. I mean, that didn't occur until, you know, maybe a couple of decades ago. But they, they had the foundation of a chief risk officer and they probably had an informal person who was saying, oh, you know what, if we need something about risk management, let's go over and talk to Jen. She's over there in that office. She might not be the chief risk officer, but she knows more about risk management than anybody else. All right, level play, playing field. Yeah, international cooperation. Remember, you know, this Basel Committee was formed by a whole bunch of countries getting together and forming this, uh, this supra-national organization. And public confidence. You know, I'm going to go ahead and editorialize here. Uh, sometimes governments and these organizations, in fact, I'll say most times they're on the right path and they make the right decisions, but some, sometimes they don't. And so they're 
is the risk of erosion of public confidence. All right, I'll take off my editorial hat. All right, deposit insurance. What do we know here in the United States that uh, if I deposit 249,000 into Jim's bank and uh, the bank fails, the government will come in and pay me 249,000. But if I deposit 251,000 in Jim's bank and it fails, the, the government will come in and pay me just $250,000. You know, so that sounds like a good thing, right? Here's the government coming in and saying, you know what, you as a depositor, you don't have to worry about your $250,000 because we'll go ahead and support that. We'll subsidize any losses that the financial institution in occur, incurs. So what that means is that gives me as the depositor confidence in the financial system so that I can, uh, I know that my, my capital is safe. Now, if I have a million dollars, what I'm going to probably do is I'm going to probably put 250 in Jen's bank and 250 in Bob's bank and 250 in Pete's bank and 250 in somebody else's bank, right? To spread, spread that out. And that's not an uncommon practice. But what is the problem with this? The problem then is that the financial institution could take that $250,000 and lend it to my son, right? To my son who has a high credit risk. And they say, look, you know, if we fail over here uh, and if you fail over here, it doesn't matter. The government is going to go ahead and give me back my $250,000. So this brings in the concept of a moral hazard hazard problem, which is just essentially a scenario under which decisions can be made in the absence of, of risk management. Now, of course, this deposit insurance, like any other insurance, is not free, so the banks have to pay a premium, and then that fund goes and, and makes those payments. Yeah, so here's a good slide to illustrate what I was saying here. Banks may take on riskier investments and loans, right? Less vigilant in monitoring. You know, what GARP is super interested in, we'll hear about this throughout part one and part two, I'll use the word monitoring regularly. You know, what, what do we do? We need to monitor so that we know about those. Well, what did we talk about just a few minutes ago? Changes in market conditions, changes in credit condition, changes in operational conditions. And so if you have this government backing, if you always know my dad's bucket has $400 in it, you know that it's there, that you're probably going to be uh, less willing to perform due diligence. So look at the bottom there, excessive risk, and then it fails uh, if there's a failure, and then it flows onto John and Gen Q taxpayer. That's the big problem with moral hazard. This was not invented uh, in the last few years or even in 2007. This goes back way, way, way long, long time ago. Uh, how about the Savings and Loan Association crisis? This was a super, super moral hazard uh, for a variety of reasons. And I think the final bill you know, by the mid 1980s. Now remember, this is when I just this is when I just entered a PhD program in the late 1980s. So I think that final tally was uh, 300 billion or 350 billion. Of course, in today's environment, 350 billion. You know, politicians they don't even uh, bat an eyelash at that. But back then, that was super, uh, super huge amounts of capital. Yeah, look at the second bullet point. They took on excessive risk knowing the government would bail them out. Let me give you just a brief editorial here. You know, back in 1982, I was still an undergraduate. I could have, I could have opened up my own savings and loan association. I could have said, I'm Jim, I have a savings and loan association. I would have paid a small fee to the state so that I could become a formal and a legal financial institution. And I could have said, here, send me your money. I'll pay you continuously compounded interest at 7%. And so people just threw their money at SNLs back then. And here I was, a, an undergraduate student. What was I, 20 years old, 21 years old in 1980? What was I going to do with that money? I could make loans, but I'm going to you know, buy myself a house. I'm going to say, you know what, Jim, you deserve uh, stock options. You deserve uh, country club membership. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it was it was complete and perfect example of moral hazard. All right, moving on to the next uh, learning objective. <clears throat> Private placement, public offering, best efforts. Sorry, Dutch auction, which is kind of one of my favorite, uh, my favorite ones. So we could probably go through these pretty quickly because I'm guessing as good regular readers of the Wall Street Journal, you probably know all this stuff. But let's go ahead and make sure we know this at an examination type level. 
All right, so private placement. This is when a company, whether it's a public company or a private company, can sell securities, and these can be equity securities, but they might, they're might probably most likely to be fixed income securities, to a small number of private investors. Now, what this does, of course, is that it lowers the issuing cost. There is an example about Goldman Sachs and Berkshire Hathaway down there at the bottom. Public offering, we know about this. Right. This is an initial public offering. And so what happens is that the investment banking firm will say something like, hey, you know what? You want to raise one hundred million dollars. Here's one hundred million dollars. Have a great day. You give us the right to sell your securities. Now, we'll talk about best efforts here in just a second. You know, but this is the underwriting function of the investment banking industry. What they do is they provide advice. Uh, they provide trading mechanisms. They have now. Remember, if I'm if I'm Jim's huge uh, investment banking firm, I have a ton of clients over here, and so I'm going to help a company with this initial public offering. And so I'll be able to tell my clients, "Hey, look, that company over there—it's a great company. You ought to buy those uh, bonds or those shares of stock." There's a good example down there at the bottom <clears throat> with Tesla. Now, remember, these can be an initial public offering or they can be what's known as a seasoned equity offering company that's already been publicly traded. So here's what I was saying a little bit uh, ago. Types of public offerings, they can be uh, in, in general, one of two kinds, the best efforts in which the investment banking firm says, oh, you know what? We're going to try our best. We're going to do our best to sell all these shares of stock. And if we don't, we're going to just if we can't sell all of them, we're going to return those to you. So look at that second uh, block point there. The company bears the risk in the best efforts offering. That's probably a great exam question. Look at the top block point there. Uh, the investment banker, the underwriter cannot guarantee, right? Under a, a firm commitment, however, that's what I was saying, that the investment banking firm then throws all the money over there to the company. They agree to purchase all of the shares and then resell them to its client base, which would be the ideal scenario to sell everything to the clients, but then uh, and then sell it to the investing world out there. Now, of course, there's some rules associated with just selling to our clients, uh, et cetera, et cetera. We'll talk about that in a later recording. The underwriter bears more risk and may have to hold on to the unsold shares or sell them at a loss. <clears throat> So this is used, of course, for bigger companies. Best effort is used for smaller companies. Uh, I'll give you a, just a quick example here. This occurred when uh, when I first started teaching at my current school. I don't know. This was late '90s. You guys, maybe you guys know this. The David Bowie bonds was uh, was purchased. The entire amount wasn't that big of an issue by. Uh, Prudential Securities, and they uh, they held on to them. I don't even know if they're still out there. If they have matured by now, but David Bowie got his uh, he got his capital so he could build his recording studio. And what did Prudential get? Well, they got the rights to all of the great David Bowie songs that he has uh, written over the years. So here's just a quick example. And there's going to be, by the way, there's going to be a nice table here. So I'll summarize that here in just a second. So suppose we're a startup and we have this new idea. We want to raise $10 million through a best efforts. Two million shares at five, $5 a share. So there's the $10 million uh, charges. Just a little bit for each share sold uh, after the offering. Not the entire $2 million, but only $1.5 million are sold, which means $500,000 are unsold. So what happens to Company X? It receives only $7.5 million. It needed $10 million. It only gets $7.5 million. So nobody at Company X is happy about this. <clears throat> and then, of course, the underwriter takes, uh, takes that profit in there of uh, $1.2 million. Now, this is the bad case scenario. The best case scenario would be the, in the opposite where uh, go down to that third teardrop point after the, op, uh, after the offering, all 2 million shares were sold and then everyone's happy, happy. And then of course, you know, what if they got 3 million bids or 4 million bids, you know, then there's negotiation and the company could then, you know, have an extra issue or a seasoned offering at some time in the future. 
Now, what about under this uh, firm commitment? So the underwriter, we're going to buy the 2 million shares at $5. So that's the same as the previous one, but it hopes to resell them to the public at $6 per share, right? If there are only one and a half million sold, then what happens is that X is happy. Company X is happy. Well, in that it receives its $10 million. I mean, it's not happy that there were still $500,000 that were unsold. Uh, you know, that's a different conversation with advice and knowledge and all that kind of stuff that goes into the process here. But what the underwriting firm is forced to do then is hold on to those 500,000 unsold shares. So what it can do is it can hold on to them in the hopes that those prices go up to, you know, $6 or $8 or $12, but it might sell them at a loss if they fall to $3 or $1. So here's a good uh, summary table of what we just described. So I'll let you guys pause the video if you want to go through the math there and see that, but I'm going to go ahead and move on. Initial public offering. This, of course, is when a company issues shares to the public. I always tell my students, think of a private company going public. Uh, I Every once in a while, I'll go ahead and mention my favorite TV show back in the old days, Ewing Oil and J.R. Ewing. I'm guessing that none of you know about that show, but it was a, a family-owned oil company and J.R. Ewing. He was a bad guy, but he was so much fun to watch. And uh, there was always a threat that J.R. would say, if you don't vote for me, I'm going to take this company public and then we'll see what happens. And uh, uh, oh, it was great stuff back, in, uh, back when I was in high school and college. Now, of course, the issuing company is not going to be able to do this by itself. It'll hire an investment banking firm or a syndicate. You guys remember the old Wall Street journals, you know, there would be an entire page and it was called a tombstone and it would list all of the investment banking firms and part of the prospectus in there, including the offer price <clears throat> and number of shares. What happens then, this is the primary market, by the way. So it goes through the primary market, the firm raises the capital, and then these shares then they are sold to the investing public and then they go and they're listed either on the New York Stock Exchange or some, uh, or some other exchange. Here's an example at the bottom on uh, Airbnb. How about a Dutch auction? If you go to the actual chapter, I'm going to editorialize here for a second. There's not nearly enough conversation on Dutch auctions. These are these are among the really coolest things that are out there. Um, instead of instead of here, let me go back here quickly. So uh, look at this uh, Airbnb example: sixty-eight dollars a share. <clears throat> So that $68 was set by the underwriting syndicate in conjunction with the board of directors and the executive leadership team of the issuing company. You know, they go back and forth. I mean, there are tremendous negotiations that go on in coming up with that $68. Well, with a Dutch auction, why don't we just say something like, you know what? We're not sure the price is $68 because there's all sorts of risk involved. Why don't we say something like, you know what? Let's issue these shares of stock at a range of prices. Let's say 60 to 70. So what happens then is that the investing public, the investing public says, oh, oh, I can buy these shares of stock anywhere from 60 or 70. So I can put the bids in. So you might be thinking, well, that everyone's going to get together and say, well, you know what? Let's go ahead and let's all bid $60. So we only have to pay $60. But somebody out there is going to be super smart and they're going to say, you know what, if everyone bids 60 and I bid $60 and one cent, the rules of the Dutch auction are <clears throat> that I have to be the first one taken. And so I'm going to get in there and then all those other people will have to be prorated. And so everyone knows what's going to happen. And so sooner or later, everyone's willing to bid, let, let's say, let's say $70. So the Dutch auction is really cool because at first glance, you would think, you would think that it would lead to a price of 60, but essentially it leads to a price of 70 because investors are, are concerned about what other people are doing. Yeah, so this is really cool. So there's an example at the bottom with uh, U.S. Treasury doing a, doing a Dutch auction. And so let's go through an illustration so you can see exactly what I mean. So we want to issue 2 million shares. Price is 10 to $15. So based on the bid submitted, the clearing price works out to be $12 with 2,200,000 shares bid at $12 or above. So what happens is that you have 
some people bidding at 10, some at 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15, and all the prices in between. And so look here, buyers one and two, they're not gonna receive shares. Buyers three is gonna receive, let's do this in a, uh, uh, in a little Excel spreadsheet. So here's buyer one, who agrees to buy 500, I'm sorry, 50,000 shares at $10. Buyer two, three, four, five, 157, 450. And those numbers in the second column, they could be almost anything. But according to the rules of the Dutch auction, what has to happen is that you take the highest bid. So there's the $15. So what uh, happens is that the company issues 450,000 shares at $15 to bidder six, and then 600,000 at $14 a share at bidder five, right? And then 13, and then 12. And so what happens then is that everybody, everybody, including bidder six and five and four and three, they get to buy the shares and they get to buy them at $12. Bidder one and two, they bid too low. They don't get to participate in this initial public offering. And so this is super cool. What it does is it allows the market to determine the market clearing price. So look over in the bottom right-hand column, uh, there's the raising of $24 million. All right, let's move on to conflicts of interest. There are tons and tons of conflicts of interest. How about investment banking versus the brokers? So we'll work through a couple of examples here. We have a, uh, a new issue for a client, but it's received poorly by investors. So what happens is that we say something like, hey, you know what? Let's go over to the brokers, the brokerage house and say, oh my gosh, you guys can make tons and tons of money on commissions and other kinds of things if you recommend this security to your uh, clients. So we're recommending securities to the clients for uh, company shares of stock or bonds. It could be any security out there. And these bonds and shares, of, this company stinks, but we're recommending it to our clients. You see there, there's a conflict of interest. Has this ever happened in practice? Well, when we say, has this ever happened? You can almost always use Enron as an example because there were tons and tons of things that uh, were going on at Enron, Don't, uh, not least of which was that the, uh, the accounting firm, Arthur Anderson, I think that was the name back in those days, was uh, actually advising Enron on its derivatives trading desk and generating a uh, million dollars a month or a week or some tremendous amount of money uh, back in those days. So has this ever happened? Of course it's happened. And is it going to happen again? Of course it's going to happen again. How about investment banking versus commercial banking? How about if we consider a takeover? And by the way, there's a really fascinating conversation inside of this conversation about takeovers. And they go into uh, poison pills, which doesn't appear to be part of uh, uh, the learning, uh, learning objectives here. So what happens if you've got these investment bankers and commercial banking and there's a takeover and one part knows something and the other part doesn't know anything? So investment bankers may ask for confidential information about the target from commercial banking. And how about investment banking versus security services? Well, this makes perfect sense here. We make a recommendation to either buy or sell or hold, depending on whether or not we have, you know, short position or long position, or if we have, uh, uh, a current loan or a business deal or maybe a lucrative business deal in the works. How about possible solutions to this? So, uh, you know, disclosure requirements. You know, GARP is really, really big, as you'll see going through all of these futures chapters, is that, look, you know, we're good stewards of our right-hand side of our balance sheet. What we need to do is make sure that everybody knows exactly what's going on. So disclosure requirements, uh, ethical guidelines and trading. This is all part of monitoring that I suggested earlier. And then, you know, over the last decade or so, this whole whistle whistleblowing conversation pops up. You should read about this in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, this has everything to do with someone who has information regarding an immoral or an unethical or perhaps and most likely an illegal uh, decision or process or movement inside of a company or an organization. And so this whistleblower <clears throat> 
fears for his or her job security. So there have to be laws and regulations about whistleblowers. And so that leads back up to the second era point, uh, these strict regulations. And so, of course, what are we doing? We want to make sure that we operate in the best interests of the client, uh, whatever, whatever that means. Now, let's go back to, I believe it was 1933, when in, here in the United States, we had this Glass-Steagall Act, which was the wall that separated commercial banking from investment banking. And I said earlier that those walls are crumbling and sometimes they're rebuilt a little bit and sometimes they crumble again. So we need the separation of banking activities, which involves separating and preventing the exchange of information. So this has everything to do with the ethics of operating inside of of our financial institution, providing a model and a standard model for others to kind of emulate so that we are ethical and, and legal and, and moral. Now, over the years, this has been referred to as a Chinese wall. That name has been kind of replaced by um, you know, maybe a firewall or an ethical wall. Uh, the reason we put it in here is because the, the reading does use that terminology. And it really, it really, the, the kind of image that you get when you think about a wall is, you know, a separation of one from the other. But if you do a little bit of search on history, you know, this goes back to the, the uh, you know, the wall of China. And this thing was built so that uh, these individuals could signal to each other. So it's really a communication wall and it might have some kind of negative connotations over the years, but it really wasn't uh, designed that way. And of course, those of you who watched uh, that, that silly three movies about this thing right here, although I still watch those when they come on TV. Uh, you know, there are a couple scenes in there where they light the fire so that people can see over there of, uh, of something that's going to happen, either, either good or bad. So uh, uh, we put that in there, Chinese walls, just because of the reading. And you may see that on the exam, but think of it as an ethical wall and think of it as a good thing. Uh, here's a great question that shows up at the end of this chapter. Banking book and trading book, what do those two names suggest? The trading book means that we have some assets that we're gonna hold on to, but boy, we're, we may trade them in the next day or two. The banking book, of course, we're going to hold on to these uh, securities, fixed income securities, but they could be equity securities. And we're going to uh, you know, receive those coupon payments or those interest payments, and we wanna hold on to them to maturity. So. This is another good slide for you to get out your phone and take a picture. So trading book, or these are securities that are available for sale. Banking book, we're probably holding these, or at least our intention is to hold these until they mature. Under the banking book, we need to worry about you know default risk, but let's call it credit risk. On the trading book, we need to worry about primarily market risk. So one is short term, one is long term. One follows the international rules, one follows the US rules of GAAP. So there's credit risk and market risk, uh, banking book, higher liquidity, uh, lower liquidity and trading book. This goes back to what I was saying about the difference between floor of the New York Stock Exchange stuff and fixed income stuff. Uh, trading book, that's going to be derivative securities, banking book, loans and mortgages. Yeah, treasury bills. Yeah, yeah. Treasury bills put in comma, you know, SV Bank. All right, how about this last learning objective, the originate to distribute? So let me give you a quick history lesson. Let's go back, you know, I don't know, hundreds of years or thousands of years. What did a financial institution do? It accepted deposits, right? And it paid a relatively low interest rate on those deposits. And it took that capital and it came over here and made loans. And it made loans at higher interest rates than on the deposits. And in the old model, what that, uh, what that financial institution would do was then hold on to those loans and collect the interest in the principal payment. But this is a story that I always tell my students. I mean, let's think about it. If you're the, uh, if you're the loan officer and every day your job is to, is to lend mortgage loans. What do you do? So you send a bunch of money to homeowners over there. And for the next 30 years, you have to go knock on those people's front door and say, hey, where's your monthly payment? <laughs> Remember me? And you do that every month and you do that every day for 30 years. It gets old. So the originate to distribute banking model means that we go ahead and make the loans. And then instead of servicing them for 30 years for a mortgage, we just sell them to somebody else and let them worry about collecting the interest in the 
principal payments and then we sell them and we get more capital, which means we can make more loans. That's why in the old days, if you go back to like, I don't know, 1975 and you look at uh, and you look at the income statement for a large commercial bank, like what was a commercial bank back in 1970? Manufacturers Hanover, were they around in 1975? Almost all of their income came from interest income and a small percentage came from, you know, fees and commissions and all that other stuff. But now if you look at, uh, uh, manufacturers Hanover, which was taken over by, uh, it was taken over by Chase, I don't know, 1985 or 1995. And then Chase and then Chase and, you know, whoever, whatever Chase is these days. But if you look at that one, more, in, more income is generated, more revenue is generated from other stuff rather than, rather than interest income because of this originate to distribute banking model. So the good question is, you know, define it. And here's a good slide on defining it. So what do we do? We assess the credit worthiness and make the lend, lend the money. And we throw all these secure, these loans together into a pool. This is called securitization. And then we sell them to outside investors. So you understand that process, but the good questions are benefits. So risk diversification, of course, liquidity, wider access to credit, and then investor opportunities. Ah, what this does is this allows regular old investors like me to find a security out there, like a mortgage-backed security, so I can invest in residential or commercial mortgages, which I could not do before investor opportunities, and that's wider access to credit. What don't we like about it? Well, the simple fact that, boy, am I going to, am I going to perform as much of a broad and deep due diligence if I know that I can lend this money over here to some bozo borrower, a BB, a bozo borrower, and then I can just quickly sell it over here to somebody else and let them worry about credit risk and default risk. So lacks underwriting standards. Here's this moral hazard again, misaligned incentives. Boy, complexity of securitization. You know, we've got these different tranches. We'll talk at length about this as we go through uh, we go through the entire process. And then, of course, if we do make all these bad decisions in Diamond Point One and Two and Three, does this flow over to other financial institutions and then to the economy in general? All right, so there's a recap of those learning objectives. We hit every one of these. What I want you to do now is I want you to go to the end of the chapter and I want you to look at those 20 questions. And the cool thing about these next 20 chapters is that there are 20 questions at the end of each of these chapters. So what's 20 times 20? I don't think I need my financial calculator to say that's 400 questions. So you're going to have my recording, our recordings here to help you understand and get you on solid footing here and in part one. And then let's, let's leverage our newfound knowledge by going over all 400 of these questions as we prepare for the exam. Now, look, I can say to you things like, you know what, this sounds like a good exam question that I would craft if I were making up the exam. But remember, GARP is making up these exams. So the best source of what it is thinking is going to be these 400 problems at the end. So go spend, you know, 30 minutes or so right now looking over those 20 questions. Take some notes for yourself. Get out an index card, one index card, not a little teeny one like this, but get out, you know, a little bigger one and make notes. So you're going to have 20 of these. Uh, what does GARP think is important for these 20 chapters here in part one? So, hey, I had fun visiting with you today. Uh, I hope this was beneficial. So have a great day and good luck studying.